continuing our studies in the Gospel of Matthew. My message today is entitled, Our Story, His Story. Our Story, His Story, which incidentally is the theme also for our 25th anniversary celebration on the 17th of November. So again, I, I repeat, if you have not uh, fixed the date in your calendar, please do so. What does it mean? Why did we choose this theme for celebrating 25 years of God's faithfulness? It means this. None of us live our lives for ourselves. Our story is His story. Every one of us, without fail, has a call and a mission to fulfill. What I call a prophetic destiny. You are not just a number. You're not just saved so that you can get to heaven. No. We are saved for something distinctive and unique that only you can do for God. Your story, His story. Our story, 25 years, His story. And I find this, sub, this topic very appropriate in the passage of Scripture that we're doing today, which is essentially about John the Baptist. So can you turn with me to Matthew chapter 3, verse 1 to verse 12. So if your Bible turned with me, and if not, this is it. Why don't we read it together? Shall we do that? Let's all read Scripture together. All right, Matthew chapter 3, verse 1 to verse 12. Can, can, I, can I say this uh, before, before we read the, God, the Word of God? That this would be the, 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 the what I call that, the, the pattern every week now as we do Matthew. Huh? means to say that every week as we do one chapter, uh, uh, the, the chapter is a very big one, no? very, very long. Like Matthew chapter 3, there are many other verses. So like I will do Matthew chapter 3, verse 1 to 12 for the first and second service. And then for the third and fourth service, Pastor Jeffrey will now take the rest of the chapter of Matthew. And it will be the same now for every weekend. You have two different speakers taking two different passages of Scripture from the same chapter, you know. And in this way, I think we can finish the Gospel of Matthew. Okay? So this is what will happen every weekend. Two speakers... One and two, three and four, two different topics from two different passages, but from the same chapter. So let's all read together Matthew chapter 3, verses 1 to 12. Are you all ready? All right, let's all read left to right, front to back, read out loud so that you can hear yourself reading. One, two, three. In those days, John the Baptist came preaching in the wilderness. Judea, repent, for the kingdom of heaven is near. This is he who was spoken of through the prophet Isaiah, a voice of one calling in the wilderness, prepare the way for the Lord, make straight paths for him. John's clothes were made of camel's hair, and he had a leather belt around his waist. His food was locusts and wild honey. People went out to him from Jerusalem and all Judea and the whole region of Jordan. Confessing their sins, they were baptized by him in the Jordan River. But when he saw many of the Pharisees and the Sadducees coming to where he was baptizing, he said to them, Who warned you to flee from the coming wrath? Producing fruit in keeping with repentance. And do not think you can say to yourselves, we have Abraham as our father. I tell you that out of these stones, God can raise up children for Abraham. The axe is already at the root of the trees, and every tree that does not produce good fruit will be cut down and thrown into the fire. 
I baptize you with water for repentance. But after me comes one who is more powerful than I. His winnowing fork is in his hand, and he will clear his threshing floor, gathering his wheat into the barn and burning up the chaff with unquenchable fire. Clearly, the whole passage is on John the Baptist. So I'm going to address it under five separate headings. Who was John the Baptist? What was his mission? What was his message? One further profound implication of his message, and then I'll end it, giving you five take-home points. I just want to say that right at the beginning that the temperature of my message goes up higher and higher, and I think it will reach boiling point around here. Okay? So you hold on to your seats, all right. Who was John the Baptist? I just give you four bullet points because I don't want to spend too much time on this. You can get it from the Bible. This is not true. I made a mistake. Someone corrected me, you know, a young adult corrected me when I said yesterday at the first service that John the Baptist was the first cousin of Jesus because Mary and Elizabeth were sisters. I was wrong. So interesting, a young adult came to me. He said, Pastor, check it out. Luke chapter 1, verse 36. No, Elizabeth was not the sister of Mary, but the first cousin of Mary. I was wrong. So if Mary and Elizabeth were first cousins, it makes John and Jesus second cousins. So I was wrong, okay? So I stand to be corrected. And the name John was actually given by God personally through the angel to Zechariah, you shall call your son John. Now, I like the name John because it's also the name of my first and only grandson, Jehan, all right, which is a variant of John, which means God's gift. A any, any Johns here? Two, two, three. I'm sure there are, right? Nobody here. Oh, God, John, of course, John. Hey, John, you're blessed. John means God's gift, all right? So, John the Baptist was God's gift. And you know that John the Baptist was actually spirit-filled while he was in the womb. Why? Because in Luke chapter 1, which is a more extensive account of John the Baptist, we read that Elizabeth, sorry, Mary, went to visit Elizabeth. And while they were still a distance away, the baby in Elizabeth's womb, John, was full term, and Mary was only three months pregnant, the baby in Elizabeth's womb leapt up with joy. Why? Because he was filled with the Holy Spirit. Tells me one thing. Remember, it is John the Baptist's baby full term that leapt with joy. Eh? No news of Jesus leaping with joy because she's only three months pregnant and there are no fetal movements felt at three months. So the Bible is also obstetrically correct. But it also tells me this, that babies can be filled with the Holy Spirit while in the womb. Not only babies can be filled with the Holy Spirit, it also tells me that Baptists can also be filled with the Holy Spirit. So if you are a Baptist, there's hope for you. And one other thing I learned was that Zechariah belongs to the priestly line. He was a Levitical priest, and that's the reason why, while he was performing the duties in the temple, the angel appeared to him, which means to say, by implication, that John come, came from a priestly line, the Levitical priesthood, which means to say, by implication, that John could have lived a very comfortable and luxurious lifestyle. Why? Because they favor the priests. They gave a lot to the priests. But Instead of that, he chose to live in the Judean desert. This is the Judean desert. The Bible tells us in verse 4, he ate wild honey and ate locusts, and he, 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 he had a, a, a clothes made of camel's hair, 
and a leather belt around his waist. This is the poor man's diet. And he dressed like Elijah. Why? Why did he forsake a comfortable life, being part of the priestly lineage, to go into the Judean desert and live that kind of a life? The reason is because he's got a mission to fulfill. And this mission, we all know this, is to prepare for the coming, the first coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. In other words, something in John the Baptist's life from the moment he was born, something in his life was marked out for God. But you say, Pastor, this is John the Baptist. No. It's for you and I. I believe that every single one of you, the moment that you and I were born, and born again, were called to a specific mission. That is why I entitled this message, Your Story, His Story. His stream. That is why every one of you, the moment you were born, and more important, born again for a purpose. It is not distinctive only to John the Baptist. He's a prototype. It's not specific only to John the Baptist. But to every one of us here, and there's maybe about a few hundred of you here, every one of you without fail, God knows you by name. He wrote, He has written your name in the palm of His hands. You are not a nobody in the sight of God. And more important than that, He saved you so that you and I can fulfill what I call your prophetic destiny. There is something, something you can do that other people cannot do. Why? Because you are unique. Your thumbprint is unique. Your eye is unique. Your connections are unique. So there must be a purpose. And you and I have to to realize that. That all of us, without fail, have a mission and a prophetic destiny to fulfill. But for John, clearly he he was called for this mission to prepare the way of the Lord. And in Scripture, there are two Old Testament prophets, three Old Testament passages that tells of this preparation, this Isaiah one, all right? The other one is in Malachi. The Isaiah passage is quoted in Matthew. uh, Prepare the way for the Lord. A voice crying in the wilderness. But there was another Old Testament prophet, and it's not by accident that he is the last Old Testament prophet in the Old Testament. Malachi, that prophesied years before John the Baptist was born, about the coming of John the Baptist, who will now prepare the way for the coming of Jesus. So let's look now at the Malachi passage, and you'll be amazed at what the prophet Malachi says. Now let me unpackage it. The mission of John the Baptist, very important. This is where the temperature begins to go up, okay? First passage. Malachi chapter 3, verse 1 to verse 2. I will send my messenger. Look, let's read it. Shall we do that? Let's all read it with me, okay? So we're going to read scripture together. Are you all ready? Left to right, front to back. Read out loud, huh? Are you ready? One, two, three. I will send my messenger who will prepare the way before me. Then suddenly... The Lord you are seeking will come to His temple, the messenger of the covenant, 
whom you desire will come, says the Lord Almighty. But who can endure the day of his coming? Who can stand when he appears? For he will be like a refiner's fire or a launderer's soap. Verse 1. God says, I will send my messenger through the prof prophetic voice of Malachi who will prepare the way before me. So clearly, this messenger refers to John the Baptist because it echoes what the prophet Isaiah says, a voice crying in the wilderness, prepare ye the way of the Lord. But what is strange is this. Suddenly, the Lord you are seeking, He will come. Who is the Lord? The messenger of the covenant will come. Suddenly, there is another messenger, the Lord. There are two messengers. Why? Because John the Baptist is never called the Lord. So if you look at this one verse, the prophet Malachi is prophesying about two messengers. Coming to the temple. Could it be the third temple? Don't you know? The messenger, the Lord of the covenant. What covenant? New covenant. But what is strange is this. The prophet Malachi continues in verse 2. Who can endure the day of his coming? Who can stand when the Lord appears? He will be a refiner's fire or a launderer's soap. Wait a minute. Since when has Jesus come to refine fire? I thought when the Lord comes for the first time, it is to save. It is to deliver. But here he talks about uh, 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 the refiner's fire. And the first coming is never called the day of the Lord. Whenever the term, the day of the Lord, it is always referred to the second coming. So is it first coming or second coming? Or, or is it both? And this prophecy is emphasized in the second ver uh, passage of Malachi in the last verse of the Old Testament when he says, See, I will send the prophet Elijah, which refers to John the Baptist, and Jesus. I don't have time to refer this to you. Privately, if you ask me, I will... I have to spend another 15 minutes explaining to you why this refers to Jesus. Before the great and dreadful day of the Lord. Wow! So, here we have the prophet Malachi, let me summarize, prophesying about the first coming as well as the second coming. Wow! This is a summary. The prophet Malachi, therefore, prophesied at the last book of the Old Testament before Matthew. That is the reason why Matthew is the first book in the New Testament. It's a seamless transition, you see. God will send John the Baptist as the first messenger to prepare the way for Jesus who will now come to save, not to judge. And then Malachi also prophesied the second messenger, which is the Lord Jesus of the new covenant, and now he will come with refiner's fire to judge. But wait, how come Malachi cannot differentiate between the first coming and the second coming and mix it all into one one? Huh? Now, let me explain to you. We can understand why this is so if we understand how a prophet in the Old Testament sees prophecy. And this is a diagram. So if we look now about prophecy from the eyes of the prophet Malachi, this is how he sees. When he sees prophecy in the future, he just sees one hill. He doesn't see two hills. He sees the first coming of Jesus, 
John the Baptist as a messenger prepared the way of the Lord. At the same time, he also sees the second coming of Jesus as a second messenger of the covenant to judge and to cleanse with refining fire. But if you are Malachi, you see this and you see one hill. He does not have the, the advantage of us who now watch it from this angle and actually there are two hills in one. When a prophet sees with his seer eyes, he sees happenings and events. He doesn't see timeline. But if you now watch this, actually, there are two comings in Malachi's time. Why is this important? Why is this important? As I was preparing this message, the Spirit of the Lord then prompted me. Wing Chi, if we need a priestly line of John the Baptist to prophesy and prepare for the first coming of Jesus, who will prepare for the second coming of Jesus? And the Lord says, you and me. Why? Because all of us are now priests. You don't need another John the Baptist. All of you are modern day John the Baptist. Why? Because in 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 9 to verse 10, it says that all of us believers in Jesus Christ are a chosen people. You are selected. You are chosen. You are a royal priesthood, meaning that you are now priests to the king. No more high priest, right? No more high priest. You are better than a high priest. You are a royal priest. So all of us now have the responsibility after Jesus has come, He's going to come back again. Prepare the way of the Lord. Come on, let's give God a clap offering. Shall we do that? Now, this is where the temperature increases, all right? And it will reach boiling point in a short while. The question, therefore, I ask myself, if this is the mission not only of John the Baptist, but if I were to contextualize it and contemporize it today for you and for me as our mission as well, what is the message? What is the message that you and I need to have to tell the world to prepare for the second coming of Jesus as John the Baptist had to prepare for the first coming of Jesus? Now, I'm going to take a commercial break here. Go back to Matthew chapter 3, verse 1. Let me read. In those days, John the Baptist came, preaching in the desert of Judea and saying, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is near. This is he who was spoken of through the prophet Isaiah, a voice of one calling in the desert, Prepare the way for the Lord, make straight paths for him. This is taken from Isaiah chapter 40, verse 1 to verse 5. Now, what I'm going to say to you is very, very important to me. Very personal to me. Why? Because way back in the year 2008, and I've shared this before, when the Lord spoke to me and Pastor Lee Chu to literally use our human resources, etc., to invest big time in East Malaysia, in Sabah and Sarawak, I, I shared it with you, right? I came back from the mountain, 2008. It was during the time, I remember, of the NECF 40 days of fast and prayer. So during the time, the pastors and the staff, those who can come, we have a staff prayer meeting during lunchtime because fast and pray. Ma. I remember that after I came down from the mountain, very burdened in my heart, what, what is Lord? I'm, very, I'm not clear what you want me to do. One afternoon, the staff came to me while we were praying 
uh, uh, pastor, pastor, th- there's, there's a Mat Sali waiting to see you. No? Mat Sali means a Caucasian. So I went out and I saw this guy. His name is called Brian Newton. He was one of the early missionaries, uh, not the early, earliest one, uh, one of the earlier ones uh, that spent 20 over years in Sarawak and Sabah um, um, preaching the word. And I got to know him personally as my friend. He's a very dear friend of mine. And suddenly he appeared out of nowhere. I said, Brian, Brian, what are you doing here? It's a Wingchi, Wingchi. Very serious, you know. I got no time, he said. The taxi is waiting for me downstairs. I, I just came straight from the airport. I'm on my way to Brunei. Um, I just want to say something to you, which the Lord has asked me to say to you, and I'm going to go down, take a taxi, catch my flight to Brunei. Wow, so serious, I said. Okay, okay. First thing, he said, the Lord says to you, whatever he has spoken to you, do it. Wow. What's the second thing? Set me down. The second thing the Lord says to you, he just read from Isaiah chapter 40, verse 3 to verse 5. A voice of one calling in the desert, prepare the way of the Lord. Make straight in the wilderness a highway for our God. Every valley shall be raised up. Every mountain and hill made low. The rough terrain and the rough ground will become level. The rugged places a plain, And the glory of the Lord will be revealed. And all mankind together will see it. For the mouth of the Lord has spoken. Come on, let's give God a clap offering. You want to clap? Give him a clap offering. You know, tears come to my eyes. And I know from that moment onwards that whatever God has shown me in the mountain in the last 10 years has been God to prepare the way of the Lord. And that's what we have been doing. What was the message? What was the message that God gave to John the Baptist? And what is the message that God gives to you and to me today as we prepare for the second coming of the Lord and is imminent? What is the message? One word. Repent. One word. And I want to believe that it is the same message. No different. No rocket science. Don't complicate matters. As it was before the first coming of the Lord, so it is before the second coming of the Lord. It is still repent. Everybody say repent. One more time, repent. It is absolutely amazing that after 400 years of silence in the intertestamental period, 10 generations, I'm very sure the prophets prayed. I'm very sure the people God prayed. Heaven was closed. God was totally silent. And after 400 years from the last verse of Malachi to Matthew, God opened his mouth. One word, repent. And it is the same today. It is the same today. If you and I are to prepare ourselves and the church of Jesus Christ worldwide, don't worry about the church, worry about ourselves. Repent. Actually, this is also encrypted, if you look at it properly, in the last verse of Malachi, See, I will send the prophet Elijah to you before the great and dreadful day of the Lord. And this is how the Old Testament ended. He will turn 
the hearts of the parents to their children, the hearts of the children, their fathers, or else I will come and strike the land with total destruction. KGV says with a curse. The word turn is shof, repent. It's encrypted. And the last word in the Old Testament is destruction. 400 years of silence and suddenly in the New Testament, hope came, Jesus came, and the way to reverse the curse, reverse the destruction is repent. And this is still the cry of God to the church of Jesus Christ today because we have gone so far away from Him. But you say, Pastor, show me uh, from Scripture that this is true. Now, before that, let, let, let me share with you what it means. Now, all of you know what it is, so I won't spend too much time on this. Uh. It comes from the word shuv, is to turn, is to come back. In other words, come back to God big time. But you say, Pastor, I've been coming back, ma. Hey, sure or not? Sure or not? Maybe your coming back uh, is very different from what God wants you to come back to, you know. All right, I'm going to share this with you in a short while. And that's where the temperature goes up. At the moment now, it's 50 degrees centigrade. When I reach my fourth point, it will be 100 degrees centigrade. Are you sure or not? Why? Because this is the Word of God. And how are you and I measured? Not by Pastor Chu's exposition, huh? but by the Word of God, okay? So, it means to come back to return, to, to come back to God. But pastor, where is it in the Bible that tells me that before the second coming of the Lord, it is also repent? I, uh, it is only John the Baptist, ma. They need to repent. I don't need to repent. Hey, wrong. I got this from what Jesus says. When Jesus Christ came, He's already arrived. And what was his message? Repent! It's very consistent. And more important, in the book of Revelations, in the letters, not of another John, this is John the Apostle. Not, not John the Baptist, but another John. Do you think it is coincidental? No. The words of Revelation, Revelations 1 1, is the words of Jesus. Look at it. So Jesus is saying in his letters to the seven churches in the end days, and I just pick up one of every one of the seven letters, it is still repent. It is still repent, my friend, it is still repent. Come back to God big time. Wow. It sends shivers down me. It is to turn back. It is not Naham. It is not having crocodile tears. It is not saying, God, I come back because things are not good now. Things have happened in my house. Things have happened in my business. I, I'm so sorry. No. It's more than that. It is a total change of mindset. It is coming to God and say, God, I have been living my life this way. I have been cheating you. I have been bluffing you. I have been giving you crumbs, crumbs, cra scraps. I turn. It's my mind is changed. Now, uh, I resolve 
I determine not only for a moment uh, until my predicament is over, but for the rest of my days, I come back to you. Big time. What does it mean? If you look at the scripture, go back to Act, um, Matthew chapter 3. What does repent mean? It means literally to have a change of mindset and there are two key elements. All right, incidentally, uh, I, I quote there, 2 Corinthians chapter 7, verse, 4, verse 10. Differentiating between what we call worldly sorrow and godly sorrow. Worldly sorrow is cry, 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 cry. Huh? And then after that, live our lives as if nothing has changed. We continue to live our lifestyle and give back the passage back to Pastor Chula. You never took home the message. Or even if you took home the message, you put it on a shelf. That's not repentance. Two key elements. Oh, incidentally, uh, oh, that's it. Confess your sins. That's what it says. John's clothes were made of camel's hair. He had a leather belt around his waist. His food was four. His food was locusts and wild honey. People went to him from Jerusalem and all Judea, the whole region of the Jordan, confessing their sins. They were baptized soon. In other words, you need to say what God says about your sin. You need to sing and same thing. You cannot say, it's okay. It's not okay. If God says it's sin, it is sin. So we need to confess it and keep on confessing it. Be baptized. Many of you are baptized. But the other thing is this. Produce fruit in keeping with repentance. In other words, you got to show something. Lah. In other words, don't talk, talk. Only, uh. There must be a visible transformation of your life and your lifestyle. If you have been cursing, don't curse. Understand? You have to produce fruits in keeping with repentance. In fact, good fruits. Not plastic ones. Nowadays, plastic fruits are so real, eh? you cannot distinguish between until you put it in your mouth. Especially plastic flowers. I told you before, right? My, my, my mate took a plastic orchid that someone gave me and watered it for two weeks. <laughs> and Pastor Lee Chu said, I'm going to scold my mate. Every morning, I must take it out and water, you know. Until one morning when the water, I feel it's plastic one, you know. It looks so genuine, right? Plastic. Plastic. Plastic tears. Because you didn't need it. Listen to me, my friend. With all my heart, I say this to you. Come back to God. I don't know what it means to you, honestly. Indifferent lifestyle, ungodly life, carnality, etc., etc. And this is where I reach boiling point. Why do we need to repent? Can I not postpone it, Pastor? Can I not just think about it? No. Why? Because of the judgment of God. The axe is already at the root of the tree. I don't know where the axe is for you. The axe is already at the root of the tree. 
all they need is one chop. And the fact that it has not happened is not because you are so great. It's because God is so patient with you. I, I cannot help but not miss this portion from verse 7 to verse 10. When he saw many of the Pharisees and the Sadducees coming to him, to where he was baptizing, he said to them, You brood of vipers. Why? Uh? What's wrong with the Pharisees and the Sadducees? Do you know these guys are more religious than you, a hundred times? They memorize scripture. They fast, they pray, they give tithes. Hey, how many Christians do that? These guys are a hundred times more religious than us. But the fact is this, God hates religion. He reserves the greatest indictment uh, against the religious people. Uh. So don't be religious. Uh. Coming to church and sing a few songs doesn't save you. It's not repentance. Believe me, friend, I say this with all the love that I can muster to you and be truthful to Scripture. God hates religion and religiosity. You can fool people. You cannot fool God. Believe me. Believe me. Why? Because God says you need to repent because if you don't, I will judge. I can't help it. I'm holy. I will judge you. I will judge. Why don't we read this together? Shall we do that? Read with me. Are you all right? All right. Read, huh? Left to right, front to back. One, two, three. And every tree... But after me comes one who is more powerful than I. Gathering his sweet into the barn and burning up the chaff with unquenchable fire. Fire, fire, fire. Remember Malachi chapter 3? Refiner's fire. Scripture is very consistent. And God doesn't need your permission. Scripture is very consistent. It is there for you and for me to look, understand, grasp, transform, change. Because Scripture is very consistent. In other words, the reason why you and I now needs to declare this message to the world and to the church of Jesus Christ in Malaysia, and this message is for the church in Malaysia, we need to repent. But before we declare this message, you must repent. Because the Lord comes back the second time as a judge. Revelations chapter 1, verse 12 to 16. I turned around to see the voice that was speaking to me. When I turned, I saw seven golden lampstands. And among the lampstands was one like the Son of Man, this Jesus, dressed in a robe, reaching down to his feet with a golden sash around his chest. This is the the, 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 the attire of a judge. The hair of his head was white and like wool and white as snow. His eyes were like blazing fire. His feet was like bronze glowing in a furnace. Fire, fire, fire. 
It's not the Julie Subi kind of fire, understand? This is God's fire. Real, believe me. And I don't know what kind of form it will take. I really don't know. All I know is I, I preach the word of God to you. Come back to God. And then the, the rest of the passage you know. Let me say this. Somewhere along the line, if I were to look at this scripture a little bit more, there's one further implication. There will be a separation. He talks about the winnowing fork. And the best picture I got of winnowing fork is this one. The fork, he takes it, throws it up, and the wind begins to separate the chaff from the wheat. What is the message? It is separation in the church. Why? Because Jesus says, Help me. Help me. Four things. The wheat and the test, the good fish and the bad fish, sheep and the goats, those with oil and those who had no oil. In other words, there are two categories, good fish, bad fish, in the net. And you will look at Jesus' understanding of the parables, it is always within the context of the saved. Wow. Which side are you in? Which side are you in? Huh? There is a separation. And I say this to every one of you here. Please take this message very seriously. Because every time at each of the seven letters to the end time church, it always ends this way. He who has a ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. And my prayer is it for us in SIBKL, in this year of discipleship, think again. Think again. Because the way to reverse the curse, reverse total destruction, is to come back to God and repent. You know, last year, we had a 90 days of repentance. How many of you remember that? And many of us did that. And I want to believe that, that that is of God. 13 weeks, you know. Something happened in the life of this church, you know that? Something happened in our life, in, even in Pastor Lee Chu in my life. Every week, you know, every night, uh, we read the repentance prayer. Every night, uh, repeat it again and again and again. And as we read that, we mentioned Jonathan Chu, Christopher Chu, Rachel, Jehan. How many times? Uh? A hundred times. Uh? Repent, repent, repent. Something happened in our spirit, man. Why? Because now it gives access to God to work in your life and turn the curse into a blessing. Do you think when I say all these things, oh, your pastor, you're so drama. Huh? No, I'm not. Understand? It's because it's so urgent. And I say this, all the love that God has for you, the reason why He has not judged is because He loves you. So He gives you time to come back to Him big time. Let me close. I can have the worship team up. How then shall we live? Five ways. Number one, in the light of what I shared with you from Matthew chapter 3, verse 1 to verse 12, live a spirit-filled life. John the Baptist was spirit-filled while in the womb. 
So you don't know what a spiritual life is? This is my second commercial. Come for my seminar. In two weeks' time, I will share with you from Scripture and my own personal journey from a brethren into where I am today of how we can live a life that is totally controlled by the Spirit of God in our choices, our decisions, everything. I will show you from Scripture what it means, what it means, how critical it is. So you come. Number two, not only will you live a Spirit-filled life, you live a separate life. Now, you a separate life cannot lie. I don't want to be a monk or a nun. No, it's not that. It's not. Nobody is asking you to be spooky or hyper-spiritual. You can be in the world, but not of the world. Why? It's mindset. Mindset. Think God. Think kingdom. Always think, how can I glorify God? How can I expand His kingdom? You know, when you go to work every day thinking like that, huh? suddenly your colleague will come, can you pray for me? Suddenly you find doors open that you, you, can, you will never see open for you to impact God's kingdom. Influence like salt and light. We're going to deal with that in a short while. You have never desire. You need to ask God, God, I don't want to live my life only for, for my work, for my business, for my children, for my family. What kind of life is that? Live for God. Seek first the kingdom of God and His righteousness. And all these things will be added to you. Live a separate life. Separate means holy. La. That's all there is. La. Separate separated unto God. Live a purposeful life. I started this morning by saying that all of us, like John the Baptist, are called to fulfill a prophetic destiny that only you can do. Are you fulfilling it? Or are you wasting your time? Don't go chase other shadows, my friend. Listen to me very carefully. Answer the high call of God. Answer the high call of God. In the process, be humble and authentic like John the Baptist. I'm not asking you to wear his clothing uh, or eat his diet, right? I'm not asking you to do that. He's his posture. He's the very humble man. He's not proud. What are you proud about? Huh? Are you proud about your face? Are you proud about your lace? Are you proud about your pace? Are you proud about your mace? What does it mean? Your face means how good, how good you look. Lah. Your lace means how wealthy you are. Lah. Huh? Your, your pace means how your work, lah, your profession. Lah. And then your mace means your power. Lah. You want to be proud? Be proud of the grace. Come on, let's give it up. Lah. You want to be proud? Proud that God's grace is upon your life. What is God's grace? Unmerited favour. Don't be proud. And finally, live a Christ-centered life, my friend. Live a Christ-centered life. And John has given us a prototype. He says that Jesus might increase and we decrease. Live a life that's so focused on Jesus. It's not about what you will be, what you will do. Hey, where is Jesus in all of this? It's so strange, you know, my friend, so strange. John the Baptist never, never did any miracle, never did any sign, never did any wonder. All he did was become all this fight. And Jesus says he is the greatest of all the prophets. He is the greatest! That's what is required. Live a life that's spirit-filled. The Spirit of God will tell you what to do. Live a life that's separated to Him. Live a life that is purposeful for the glory of God. Don't waste your time chasing after worthless things. I'm not saying it's not important. Live a an humble and authentic life. And always put Jesus first. Amen.
Father, we thank you for the word that is spoken. It is the word of God. It is the word enshrined and encrypted in Scripture. Everything will pass away, but your word will never pass away. And whatever it is, it will take place. It will take place in the prophetic timeline of God. And we want to flow with it, flow into it, not out of it. Oh, Father, I want to pray this day that even as events of the world are racing towards the convergence, May we never be left out, Father Lord, but may we flow into it and be like the modern day prophet Elijah. Prepare the way of the Lord. Prepare the way of the Lord to tell the churches and the churches in Malaysia to repent. They come back to God big time. So Father, I want to bless every single person here this day that you take your word seriously and live our life with a complete change of mindset complete change of our mindset and so may the Lord bless you and keep you this day may the Lord make His face always to shine upon you and be gracious to you may the Lord turn His face turn His beautiful face towards each and every one of you and your family and always, always grant you shalom. In Jesus' precious name I pray and the gospel will say aloud.